Our next presenter was the very first guest I ever had on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Uh, you may know him from his very famous video series, The Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism. That, by the way, has just released in book form, and I believe he brought some copies of the book with him today, and I would encourage you to check that out. He is also the president of Atheist Alliance of America. He is co-host of the Raw Men podcast, and he's a real smart guy. Please welcome Aaron Raw. It's funny when people introduce me as a real smart guy. These guys did not know me when I was a young man. <laughs> All right, I saw a video uh, recently by a Christian who was upset at atheists because she said we were taking her God away. Not disproving the existence of the divine, but taking it away from her. As if it's her own personal cherished possession and not a thing that exists for everybody else. And I have, to, I have to think about that for a moment. I mean, how could you take a god away? Is it like a genie in a bottle? Huh? Give me that. <laughs> Is this your god? I don't see your name on it. <laughs> As if a god could be stolen and there's nothing that god could do about it. Right? How's that for an uber galactic overlord? Just get a couple of your boys together, a little duct tape over the face, pillowcase over the head, and it's into the back of the van. Where's your God now? <laughs> you don't know. And then after we take her God away, you know, we'd see her in a public park asking random people, have you found Jesus? <laughs> and every time somebody asks me that, I always want to answer, where was he the last time you saw him? And believers already know this, but I'll tell you, if you ever lose your God, just pray to it. It's just like when you lose your keys, in the, you lose your car in the parking lot, and you hit the button on your keys. Boop, 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 there it is. You know, why would I take your God? You know, I said, I don't need one. I mean, <laughs> having a God is a lot like having alcohol or drugs. You know, they, uh, they cause you to... to <laughs> They impair your judgment, they cause you to behave irrationally because they impair your ability to understand things properly. And uh, you would do things under the influence of religion that you would never do sober or sane or, what is the word, uh, secular, I guess. <laughs> but it turns out this isn't really about her God. The woman in the video said that she had been through some tough times and that she would not have survived were it not for her faith in her God and her religion. She didn't say that it was her God that saved her. She said that it was her faith that saved her. So God didn't do anything. You know, gods never do. And this prompted me to ask, what does her God ever actually do? And I remember as a kid asking, why did God do stuff thousands of years ago? You know, big, impressive stuff, you know, parting the Red Sea, making the sun stop in the sky, appearing to and speaking with large groups of people all at once so that everybody can, you know, can verify what they're all looking at. But he doesn't do that anymore, and he hasn't for a long time. Nowadays, the only things that God does are the vague and uh, um, questionable things that look just like what would have normally happened anyway. You know, if you survive a terrible accident, it's not the ambulance, the jaws of life, the trauma center, or the doctors there that saved your life. That was God unless they couldn't save you. If you're crippled for life, that God saved your life, unless he couldn't even do that. But then that's God too, because he took you to heaven, because God gets an excuse for everything. And God controls everything, right? I mean, if you met someone you think you were destined to meet, then how was that destiny maintained, despite all the myriad interactions of everyone exercising their free will? How many fortuitous coincidences and accidental occurrences did God have to redirect on the fly daily to make sure that that still happened. And some say he didn't do anything, that he just knew that was going to happen, and so it, you know, he could predict the future that way. Um, it's like, uh, this is the way prophecy works. If you've seen the end of the movie, you know what happens. And some say that God wrote the script. But how did he do that? 
And if he did, wouldn't that remove his own necessity, at least from the confines of the play? I mean, if God knows, if God wrote the script, and so he knows what you're going to do because he's already determined everything in advance, then how do you have free will? And if he knows what he's going to do, then why would you pray to him? Because it wouldn't, already, wouldn't he already know what you're going to pray about, and wouldn't he already know whether you're going to answer him? It's not whether God answers the prayers or not. That's not why you pray. You pray to maintain this illusion of a, a friendship with an, you know, an imaginary friend. You know, uh, because a lot of this belief is just based on an emotional dependence. And people always say that if you don't believe in God, why don't you pray to him to see if he exists? And the answer is, if you start talking to imaginary beings, you imagine them listening to you and pretty quickly start talking back. That's why people pray. It doesn't just work for gods either. If you concentrate, you can conjure memories of past lives you didn't really have, or convince yourself that you're communing with dead relatives, or even receiving telepathic transmissions from the extraterrestrial reptiles who were in charge of the Illuminati. <laughs> Our taxi driver in Scotland was convinced that he was receiving psychic revelations from the ghost of Michael Jackson. Of course you think mystical entities are listening to your thoughts. It's a simple side effect of talking to yourself, which is all prayer is. And that's why I don't pray to God to ask whether he exists. That and because that's what Kirk Cameron did, and look what happened to him. <laughs> I don't want to risk that level of cognitive dysfunction. John Lennon and George Harrison of the Beatles used to chant the mantra, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, and so forth until they were convinced that they could actually see the Hindu god appear before them and hear him talking to them. You don't need drugs to pull that off. It's psychological. It's the auto-deceptive power of pretend in a world of pure imagination. So believers think that God can hear them and that God can do whatever he wants, whatever they want, so that you can ask that two, point, uh, that two plus two be five or three or whatever you need it to be. And I myself, I confess, I know that that hopeless desperation in the face of so much wrong in the world that it would take no less than a string of miracles would be the only thing that could possibly fix it. I, I know, I've, I've felt this way ever since the election. <laughs> so how does destiny, prophecy, or fate work? All the seemingly infinite intricacies of our lives and all the incidental interconnections with everyone else. All of this, God manages just so that you can win the big game or get that job or find your little lost dog. And how does he do that? Does he take over the dog's mind to send him home? Because you know dogs don't have free will, but people do, right? So how did he entice your boss into hiring you? If he didn't use telepathy or some other form of mind control, then how does he orchestrate all of these contingencies to your advantage? And don't even think about why he didn't answer those prayers to those desperate families who were ignored in their time of need. The question is not why would he, it's how could he? So, how does God influence anything, especially the big game? Because there you got believers praying on both sides, right? Just like in war, because God has been on both sides of every war, right? But it still always comes down to the, the skill and the equipment and the training of the people. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, pray to God, but keep rowing to shore. <laughs> and it's another variant of that idea that uh, the Lord helps those who help themselves, which seems to imply that he does not help those who don't help themselves. So you may as well just say, chance favors the prepared, because that's what this is, right? Your God doesn't do anything. You do. God controls everything, right? Is there anything that is beyond God's control, apart from evolution, I mean? <laughs> you would think that if anybody that can intricate or, or can manipulate all of these little intricacies could certainly have managed evolution, but that's something he's not permitted, apparently, by his believers. But if he can save you from a natural disaster, like a tornado, right? Well, then who's responsible for the twister? Who's controlling it? Who created it? I remember this story from around 1993, a little uh, farming town in Iowa 
where tornado touches down in a field. Everybody in town runs to the center of town. And this uh, tornado comes up to this house and raises up. It's no longer a touchdown. It jumps over the house harmlessly, lands in the next field on the other side, and tears that up on its way. And then it comes to another house. I did it again. Lift it up, did no harm to the house, landed on the field, headed back into town. All the people in town hide in their biggest building, which was a church, which ended up being the only building destroyed. And the TV news that I saw, you saw only a half a dozen people survive. And as they were coming out of the ruins of God's house, they thanked God for saving them, even though their friends and their neighbors lie dead in the rubble. How could you attribute that to God? How could you thank him for it? It's not the God that saves you. It's having faith in those things, believing impossible nonsense with your whole heart, with your heart of hearts, as if that makes any sense. It doesn't. It can't. But it seems to mean something to some people. And one of my first arguments on this topic was with somebody who claimed to be objective, but then a moment later confessed that he would rather take a bullet in the ear than give up his faith. Went so much for his objectivity. I asked a Christian once what she would do if she had a time machine and was able to see Christ's crucifixion. Now, I don't think you could find Jesus even with a time machine, but we weren't talking about mythicism at that point. This was just a hypothetical thought experiment to see how unreasonable faith really is. So I asked this person, what would you do if you watched Jesus die and watched his body rot for a week and never get up again? She told me that I would be disappointed by her answer, but she said that she hoped her faith would be strong enough that she could still believe even when her eyes told her otherwise. And I heard from another activist who was protesting school prayer. The message he got back from the school was, don't do this to us. We have to believe in an afterlife. We can't let ourselves think there's just nothing. And this tells me that some believers use the word believe differently than non-believers do. If I say I believe something, first thing that it means is that I don't know it. I may have good reasons for what I believe because we either base our beliefs on reason or we base them on faith. And if we base them on reason, on reason then I'm not committed to that belief. I'm not sworn to defend it. That's just what I think is most probably correct or at least closer to the truth than whatever alternative I happen to be aware of at that time. And my position will change in accordance to my understanding of the facts. As some people maintain a sincere religious belief in this way, but not everyone. For those who base their beliefs on faith, belief turns into a verb, an act of will, of mind over matter, the power of positive thought. And they will pretend to know things no one even can know. And. Uh, For them, it seems that believe means to make believe, to convince yourself that it's true, even when you know it can't be. In this sense, the, the believers are pretenders. And I'm convinced that there's a lot of believers who don't really think that there's a God in heaven. And when the chips come down, when you see, you know, when they, when they have somebody that has died, you know, they grieve for real. It's not that they went off to Akron, Ohio. You know, it's not that they went off to heaven and you're going to see them later. They grieve for real, right? So these people seem to have a real understanding of what's real and what's not. And they're just pretending that this belief is maintained. I mean, one of my religious friends told me that I'm Christian because I like to believe that, not because I think it's true. <laughs> and I don't think he realized what he admitted to me. <laughs> a Republican legislator from, uh, what is it, Missouri? Yeah, it's always a Republican, isn't it? said that what he called Darwinism was, quote, just as much faith in, you know, just as much pulled out of the air as, say, any religion. <laughs> Which, of course, is an admission that his own religion is pulled out of the air. And if nobody's uh, familiar with that colloquialism, it means made up, out of nothing, imagined, not really true, but he believes it anyway. 
So he's accurately described what faith really is. And I'm not, I'm not talking about having faith in something. That's just trust. That's a different context. When you look in the, in the dictionary, you'll see two different contexts here. I never say that I have faith in anyone or anything because I don't want to confuse people. We're only talking about the religious context. Now, religious faith is trust too, but it's of a different sort. It's got a prefix and a suffix. Religious faith is a complete trust that is not based on evidence. And those are, those are necessary qualifiers there. I've looked this up in several definitive sources, and the consensus is that faith is a, um, is a belief that is assumed in lieu of evidence and maintained despite evidence to the contrary. And the Bible says the same, uh, albeit in a confused and jumbled way because it was written by confused and jumbled people following every logical fallacy ever listed. But if you sift through the scriptures, you'll see that faith is looking at things not seen, not seeing what is seen, and begging the question, or the logical fallacy of the circular argument routing back to an assumed conclusion. According to the Bible, not only are we expected to see what is not there, but we are blessed if we can make ourselves see what cannot be seen. This is the way the Bible describes faith. And the hymns and sermons of theologians past and present bear that out. Then you, you hear that we are supposed to believe the impossible and that reason is the enemy of faith. But whenever believers argue with infidels like me, then they turn the definition around completely backwards and say that faith is trust in the evidence because religion reverses everything. Then, a moment later, they'll tell me that they don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And we'll make other statements of that sort where they admit that they knew what faith really was and that I had it right all along. The best admission I've ever seen of this was given by John Christie, producer of the movie My Week in Atheism. In a recorded sermon that he did not expect me to see, he was addressing his own congregation and he explained what a delusion is, a fixed false belief that will not change despite conflicting evidence. He then used himself as an example. He says, I have evidence that A exists, but I choose to believe B. Although everything points to A, I'm going with B. And a moment later he admitted, fine, I'm delusional, I don't care. He admitted, that he will believe whatever he wants to believe simply because he wants to believe it and that he doesn't care whether it's true or what the truth is. He then implied that his entire congregational, or his entire congregation was delusional as well. So believing in God is more important than whether there really is a God. And that's why God is all powerful even though he can't do anything. He needs us to do his work. I know it wouldn't be that way if he were real. It's only if you want to really, really want to pretend that he's real and know that he's not. So ask not what your God can do for you. Ask what you can do for your God because he needs you to do everything for him and he needs your money. <laughs> this makes perfect sense if one, pretenders gotta pretend and two, some lazy liar is getting rich off of that. Now, this scam has been going on since the dawn of man, where men have had to do whatever their God needed them to do, or that he couldn't do for himself. For example, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the story of Noah's Ark, or the Ark of the Covenant, or the tabernacle in Exodus, right, we'll see that God can create planets and animals and everything that humans can't make, but he can't make anything humans can make. He can't make a box, or a boat, or a building, right? He needs his people to build his church and to adorn his clergy with the finest clothes, just like it still is today. God described the dimensions of the boat and how the tabernacle was to be constructed, and he was oddly specific about how Aaron's robes were supposed to be lined with gold and decorated with precious stones, because God always makes sure that his clergy get the best that the peasants can pay for. And when God described the sculptures that were supposed to adorn the Ark of the Covenant, I had to wonder, well, wouldn't it just been easier to just poof that out of nothing too, right? I mean, why would God have to say, here, I need you to make this and make it look just like that, but you have to do it because I can't. Because apparently God can only evolve things naturally. Now look what other gods can do. I mean, the lady of the lake, right? She can at least forge a sword. God's people have to fight with stones and bones found on the ground. 
And what was God's fascination with written instructions? Especially when he writes so badly that we can't tell divine wisdom from the, the, the insane ravings of ignorant primitives. I mean, if you created mankind and you love them, why would you remove yourself from them and trust them to interpret a book read in your absence? Especially when that's not the only book on the shelf because other gods of other religions got their books too. If you're gonna write a book telling men how to live, why would you fill it full of rituals and prohibitions that don't make any sense and not have one word of accurate or useful information in the entire tome? Why would you include explanations for things we all know are wrong, right? Rabbits don't chew cud, bats are not birds, whales are not fish, ritual sacrifice will not cure leprosy, and a cow's, the, the color pattern on a cow is dictated by its genetics, not whether it looks at things with stripes. <laughs> the Bible describes the earth as a flat disk uh, divided into four quadrants, often mistranslated as corners, and standing on pillars. It's not round like a ball, it's round like a table and covered with a giant crystal dome that has windows in it to let the water in because this snow globe of an earth is sitting in an oceanic abyss where there is water above the sky. And inside, the sun, moon, and stars exist within the expanse of this dome. The Bible actually says all this. Wherein the sun is smaller than the earth and the same size as the moon, and the moon is bigger than all the stars. This was a common belief across Asia at that time, but every word of it is wrong. If you wrote the Bible, would you have included anything that is in there now? Instead of telling people to be fruitful and multiply and dominate and subdue the earth, shouldn't there have been a limitation based on population followed by a provision for the conservation of the environment? Maybe. What if, instead of reinforcing logical fallacies and uh, promoting the, uh, gull the gullibility or uh, prohibiting heresy with the threat of a fate worse than death, shouldn't the Bible have at least taught the philosophy of science so that we could figure things out for ourselves, right? Because then we could have landed on the moon a thousand years ago. And wouldn't it have been a good idea if the Bible explained a few things about medicine, microbes, and contagious pathogens? Because just think about the generations of suffering that could have been avoided if the Bible had been written by somebody who actually knew something. People say the ancient Jews knew they were supposed to wash their hands and that God must have told them that. But children know that. Raccoons know that. <laughs> and then Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says not to wash your hands. Why? Because he doesn't know about germs. He thinks diseases are caused by demons or by uttering curses. This is the guy America worships? They didn't listen to the crazy things he said, did they? Come to think of it, they didn't listen to the same things he said either. Instead of perpetuating prejudice and paranoid propaganda with special privileges for certain people, shouldn't the Bible have taught tolerance and spoken against racism, slavery, misogyny, and so on? Because as it is, the good book has no good in it, and God obviously did not write it. But this is what God does do. He grants excuses. You have the excuse to be holier than thou with righteous indignation. And when you judge other people, just say that it's God judging them. Because God hates everything that you do. And he forgives everything that you do. Because God is you. That's how he lives inside you. Believing in him makes you better than other people. And enables you to deny their rights. And to deny reality when you want to. Uh, you can pretend to witness things no one has ever seen and know things or understand things no one knows and know things that aren't even true. You are excused from having to do anything. You don't have to help anyone because you could just wish upon a star that they get the help that they need and you can pretend that you've done something by doing that. And you don't have to be accountable either. You don't have to atone for anything or even admit the slightest guilt because the God in your mind has already justified whatever it is that you did. You have an excuse for the most outrageous arrogance. Despite your ignorance, you know more than all the experts. And despite your claims of humility, you think you're the reason the universe exists. Because the world was created for us. And we don't have to take care of it. We can do whatever the hell we want to it because Jesus is coming back any minute now to torch it all anyway and save us from ourselves. You are even excused from death. 
or at least from admitting what that really is. Because regardless what you believe about, you know, I'm never going to die, I have eternal life or whatever, I will not even taste of death, no. Regardless of what your religion is, we all run the risk of writhing on the floor in agony, clutching our chest and straining to gasp that last breath. No matter what false promises they make, no religion saves you from that. And you may believe differently, but regardless what you believe, regardless whether there is a God or an afterlife, doesn't change the fact that in this life, history will be our judge. Thank you. Thank you.